Let's go to the second endangered species in the digital age. And here we're talking about thought and truth. In his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, Nicholas Carr talks about the explosion of content on the internet. So there's a lot of text, there's a lot of video, there's a lot of images. He cites an interesting finding from a study that shows that whenever people are reading from their phone, from their tablet, or from their computer screen, they tend to skim, they tend to speed read, and they don't tend to engage in deep reading. Carr writes, when we go online, we enter an environment that promotes cursory reading, hurried and distracted thinking, and superficial learning. Now, it's possible to think deeply while surfing the internet, just as it's possible to think shallowly while reading a book. But that's not the type of thinking the technology encourages. So what the internet does, if we're not careful, is that it chips away our capacity for concentration and contemplation. According to him, whether we're online or not, our mind now expects to take in information the way the internet distributes it. And what is this new kind of mind? It is a mind with a huge appetite for sound bites and info nuggets. We're no longer into reading long paragraphs. We prefer sound bites and info nuggets. So we're evolving or devolving from a linear mind, a mind that is calm, focused, and undistracted, to a new kind of mind that wants and needs to take in and dole out information in short, disjointed, often overlapping bursts. The faster, the better. Now, as we can see, this is not conducive for deep thinking. Blogger Andrew Sullivan calls this an ecosystem of interruption technologies. All those notifications, all those distractions, they create an ecosystem of interruption technologies that result in what he calls a distraction sickness. Carr also talks about a reversal of the early trajectory of civilization. Human beings evolved from being hunters and gatherers in the forest to being cultivators of their own food with the rise of agriculture. But now because of the unintended consequences of the internet, we are evolving from being cultivators of personal knowledge to being hunters and gatherers in the electronic data forest. I think we're all familiar with the copy and paste culture. A common phenomenon is that we look for information and information is so easily accessible today but we don't have the time or habit of processing the information that we find. So what happens really is that there's also a kind of intellectual emotivism, what psychologists call confirmation bias. We tend to pick and believe the information that confirms whatever it is we want to believe. Again, we're not saying that anyone who is exposed to the internet or social media will not be able to think. What we're saying here is that if we're not careful, we might be vulnerable to the unintended consequences and undesirable effects of the use of the internet and social media technology. And that is the tendency to engage only in superficial thinking. It's quite possible to think deeply, to be a critical thinker, even if you're using technology, but that's not what the technology encourages. The technology produces the tendency to think shallowly and to be a mere hunter or gatherer in the so-called electronic data forest. Let's pause a while and just think about these two images. On the one hand, we have the cultivator of personal knowledge. And on the other hand, we have the hunter and gatherer in the electronic data forest. Now, if you were given a continuum from one to four, where one represents being a mere hunter or gatherer in the electronic data forest, and four represents being a cultivator of personal knowledge, where would you locate yourself? Note that it's one to four. There's no middle ground. There's no three. Because I'd like you to choose what your tendency or inclination is. Think about that. We've been talking about what I consider the second endangered species in the digital age, and that's thought. 
Related to this is also the endangered species of truth. Back in 2005, Stephen Colbert in the Colbert Report coined a word. The word he coined was truthiness, which he contrasts with truthfulness. Move over, Oprah. Tonight, every member of my audience receives a priceless gift. The truth. This is the Colbert Report. Truthiness. Now, I'm sure some of the word police, the wordanistas over at Webster's, are going to say, hey, that's not a word. Well, anybody who knows me know that I'm no fan of dictionaries or reference books. They're elitist. Truthiness. Define it. Truthiness is what you want the facts to be as opposed to what the facts are. What feels like the right answer as opposed to what reality will support. Now remember, this was back in 2005. Today, all we need to do is look at some of our politicians to see how people are practicing truthiness quite blatantly. According to Politico's five-day analysis, when he was campaigning for president, Trump averaged about one lie every three minutes and 15 seconds over nearly five hours of remarks. That average has gone up ever since he became president. Now, why is truth an endangered species? If we look at the history of education, we can understand why truth can be considered an endangered species. Here's a crash course on the history of education. We could think of education as divided into stages based on people's access to information and based on the quality control over that information. Of course, as we know, in the very early stage of education, villagers would gather around their elder who would share knowledge with them, who would teach them. In oral tradition, access to information was limited to the listeners of the elder and quality control was quite minimal. Because aside from the elder himself, there is nobody who is old enough or confident enough to fact check the elder. With the invention of the printing press, a new stage in the history of education is ushered in. Books were published and libraries were built. The big change here is that quality control has improved tremendously. Obviously, because of the cost of publication, proofreaders, editors, and publishers have to do their work before a book sees print. With the publication of books and the opening of libraries, access increased, but remained limited to those who can afford to buy books or those who can read. What about where we're at today? If we examine our access to information and the quality control exercise over the information that is so easily accessible today, where would you locate yourself in this table. Let me try to guess your answer. I think you will agree with me when I say that access to information would be on an all-time high, as long as you're a digital have, as long as you have Wi-Fi access, then certainly you will have easy access to information. But the information you can access would be all sorts of information because there's virtually no quality control. Any Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Jill can post anything, make any claim on the internet, and even if other people fact-check them, there's no guarantee that people will evaluate the information adequately or correctly. When you think about it, this combination of a high access to information coupled with a minimal quality control is a very dangerous one because it leads people to think that they know a lot because they have a lot of access to information and that access is quite easy but the problem is they may not be aware that the information they claim to have is not accurate or correct. Or worse, they may not be willing to concede that. There was this interesting and instructive social experiment conducted on Facebook some years ago where basically they wanted to determine what percentage of readers would share articles without reading them. I don't know if you've done that, but I admit I've done that a couple of times before. The way the experiment was designed was quite clever. They wrote a news article with a catchy headline 
and with the first paragraph quite intact, intelligently, and almost impressively written. But the second and succeeding paragraphs were pure gibberish, nonsense. So what they did was they posted this article on Facebook and monitored how many percent of readers actually shared the article. Obviously, if they shared the article, it means that they did not read the whole thing. Well, they found out that 70% of readers actually shared the article. Again, no judgment, no guilt. It's just an observation that we do have this tendency. Even the most intelligent person can be tempted to share an article because there's just no time. We lead such busy lives and the internet makes it very convenient for us to share all this information. We often hear the term, the post-truth era, which actually should give educators a nervous breakdown because our job is really to preserve and promote the truth. So when you have a post-truth era, people are saying that the truth doesn't matter or people have their own truths and you have to respect those truths. Howard Gardner makes this observation about the effects of digital media Never in history have there been so many accounts and claims to truth. That, of course, is pluralism. But he also adds, everyone is right as long as it feels right. So again, we have emotivism here and, of course, relativism. So it seems like just like moral individualism, emotivism and relativism, intellectual individualism, intellectual emotivism, and intellectual relativism are also tendencies resulting from social media technology. John Sexton, in his book, Standing for Reason, the University in a Dogmatic Age, talks about, on the one hand, how we've developed this allergy to nuance and complexity, and on the other hand, an addiction to simple answers summarized neatly in slogans, which are unfortunately untestable by argument. This is clearly a formula for shallow thinking. Obviously, if you're allergic to nuance and complexity and you're attached to simple answers and slogans, you would not be encouraged to think deeply. So for a while there, we were also hearing the term alternative facts, which are really not facts, which are really lies. Again, something to be worried about if you value thought and truth. More than ever, there's a need for critical thinking there's a need for us to teach ourselves and teach others critical thinking. For me, this increasing sense of uncertainty over the growing complexity of the world has given rise to two easy or lazy responses. The first is fundamentalism, where there's only one correct answer. It gives you a certain sense of certainty, although a false one. The other is relativism, when all opinions are considered equally correct. Because here you don't need to engage in critical thinking, which of course is hard work. In short, critical thinking is not in fashion in the internet. If we want to engage in critical thinking, we need to defy the internet gravity as it were. The internet and social media do not encourage critical thinking. Rather, it breeds a tendency for superficial thinking, for skimming when we're reading, and for choosing the truth that we want to believe in. So thought and truth are what I consider the second endangered species in the digital age. What do you think about it? Now we'll talk about what I regard as the third endangered species in the digital age, and this would be relationships. Photographer Eric Pickersgill came up with a series of photographs which he intriguingly called removed. What do you think is going on in these pictures? Why do you think he called it removed? These images are increasingly familiar sights in our own lives. It's important for us to think about their consequences, their possible impact, especially on our relationships. Sociologist Sherry Torkel has coined the phrase, alone together. 
And all we have to do is look at this picture and we'll know exactly what she means. She's talking about the tendency to lose true intimacy resulting from our use of technology. I don't know if you've heard of the word fobbing. Fobbing is a term coined from combining phone and snubbing. I think we know what fobbing means. Surely we've encountered people who were multitasking, so we're having a conversation with them. They're supposedly listening to us, but at the same time, they're busy texting to their friends. Or worse, sometimes we're the ones doing the fobbing. Why is fobbing a problem? Because when we're fobbing someone, we're not being fully attentive. And we get that because when we're being fobbed, we don't like it. We feel that we're not important enough for the person to focus his attention on us and solely on us. Here's an instructive quote. If you're watching a football game with your son while also texting a friend, you're not fully with your child and he knows it. Truly being with another person means being experientially with them. Picking up countless tiny signals from the eyes and voice and body language and context and reacting often unconsciously to every nuance. These are our deepest social skills. Today we are in danger of losing these social skills. I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things from that quote. The first is we pick up countless tiny signals from the eyes and voice and body language and context. This is very much part of human communication. Human communication is not just speaking words or listening to words and making sense of those words. There are many tiny nonverbal signals that we cannot observe or catch if we're fubbing someone if our attention is divided. And the second thing I'd like to draw your attention to is we actually react to these countless tiny signals often unconsciously. So again, if we're not able to pay full attention to the person we're interacting with, we're not communicating adequately or effectively. Again, communication technology is good. It can supplement relationships especially for people we can't relate to face to face. I know a couple who were engaged to get married, but the guy was working in London and the, the girl was studying here in the Philippines. So every day they would just Skype, even without talking to one another, they would just keep their Skypes on and they would you know, draw comfort in just being present to one another. So communication technology is good. It's very beneficial, but, but communication technology should not substitute personal interactions. As we know, communication nurses our relationships. So if the technology helps, that's great. But if we're not careful, technology can actually get in the way of our communication and our relationships. How many times have you walked into a restaurant and seen a family dining together, but not talking, but they're texting on their individual phones? Sometimes we're told, to one another. Again, we're not here to this technology. I'm a heavy user of technology. I rely on technology a lot. I benefit a lot from technology. But here's one interesting study from 2000. Norman Nee, the director of the Stanford Institute for the Quantitative Study of Society, found that for every hour people spent using their internet, their face-to-face -face contact with friends, co-workers, and family fell by 24 minutes. Now, you may be thinking, why put down the internet? The internet brings a lot of benefits and it's quite possible that I can nurse healthy relationships with my family and friends and the people I work with, even if I'm a heavy user of the internet. That's so true, but studies have also shown that for every hour people spent using the internet, their face-to-face -face contact with friends, co-workers, and family fell by 24 minutes. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's important for us to be aware of that, to be mindful of that. Here's another interesting quote from blogger Andrew Sullivan, who observes what we tend to do because of our habit of using the internet and social media. According to him, we remove or drastically filter all the information we might get by being with another person. We reduce them to mere outlines, a Facebook friend, an Instagram photo, a text message. 
we become each other's contacts, efficient shadows of ourselves. Let's take time to reflect on our lifestyle and its impact on our relationships. You may want to think about these questions. What are some of the guidelines you would suggest for your relationships so that they flourish and are not endangered by technology?